My sisters and I were no child prodigies, but my parents couldn't resist saving some of our schoolwork. I recently found this poem that I wrote in first grade. It starts, Earth keeper, earth keeper, that's what I am, and ends with, how do you become an earth keeper? All you have to do is pick up trash and recycle. If only it were that easy. When I was in second grade, Al Gore published An Inconvenient Truth. I eventually learned being an earth keeper was going to be a lot harder. By the time I was leading my college sustainability club, my interest in climate change was serious. You better believe we picked up trash and recycled. But we also promoted clean energy. We had these t-shirts with a picture of a wind turbine and the tagline, I'm a big fan. Now, this switch to clean energy is being called the energy transition. But there's another energy transition that I was less aware of when I was in college. In the past 20 years, nearly a billion people got access to electricity for the first time. They use in a day what we use in less than 15 minutes. Even so, having a, a phone charger and several light bulbs is life-changing. And the improvement to quality of life with increasing electricity use is unparalleled. It provides access to washing machines, refrigerators, and air conditioners. Imagine forgoing any of those appliances for just a few weeks. Well, that would certainly be uncomfortable. We should feel just as uncomfortable about energy inequality. North America, with just 5% of the world's population, uses as much electricity as the bottom 50%. While half the world struggles to survive, our energy habits are absurd. I know this because managing energy used to be my job. As an energy efficiency engineer, my goal was reducing the energy consumption of my company's half a million square foot office building without anyone noticing or anyone being uncomfortable. Even with that constraint, there are plenty of energy saving opportunities. It's not because I'm some amazing engineer. People are just really good at wasting electricity. My drive for energy savings comes from my environmental values. Recently, two sides of environmentalism have become clear to me. For dark green environmentalism, solving climate change requires drastic energy reductions. Inspired by fears of a Malthusian famine or overpopulation, the dark side is anti-human at its extreme. Just consider the popular COVID tweet, for the Earth, humans are the virus. On the other hand, Bright green environmentalism believes that climate change and energy poverty can be solved at the same time. With a positive view of humanity, it's more optimistic for the future. I didn't see these two sides until I discovered nuclear energy as our most powerful source of clean energy. Dark green environmentalism rejects nuclear. While the bright green promise of simultaneously solving poverty and climate change seems impossible without it. Now, before embracing nuclear, I had seen a different path. I thought the grid would easily become carbon-free with solar panels and wind turbines. Remember those t-shirts? The practical experience of my first job made me less optimistic. My company had a field covered in solar panels, made for some impressive photos on our website. But solar provided just 6% of our annual electricity. This graph confirmed my experience. That solar field needed a lot of land for its small contribution. I've learned that solar needs over 60 times more land than nuclear. Now, all energy technologies require important minerals that must be mined all over the world. They're processed into metals such as uranium, zinc, copper, and many others. This graph shows how much they need. I learned that solar and wind require more mining, causing more environmental impacts in their distant supply chains. Now, my interest in nuclear may seem unexpected. It used to be the most hated technology by the environmental movement. But with widespread awareness of climate change, those feelings are changing. That's because nuclear is really low carbon. My takeaway from this graph of carbon emissions Solar, wind, and nuclear, they're basically zero carbon. While coal, oil, and gas, they're really bad. 
But isn't nuclear bad too? This graph shows the deaths caused by accidents and air pollution. You've heard about Chernobyl. You've heard about Fukushima. But have you heard about the 8 million people who die every year from air pollution caused by burning fossil fuels? If spreadsheets could write our headlines, we should be hearing about these air quality deaths all the time. Instead, our narrative is qualitative, making us think nuclear is scary. Quantitatively, the record is nearly perfect. These graphs have become fundamental to my view of energy. Nuclear has the lowest mortality rate, the lowest carbon emissions, the lowest materials use, and the lowest land use. When I understood these facts, I understood that nuclear is the safest, the healthiest, the lowest environmental impact source of energy. Seriously, how is that even possible? The key is energy density. How much energy is in a kilogram of fuel? Well, of course, it depends on the fuel. Look, there's values for wood, for oil, several other sources. But look at the bar on the bottom. See how the value for uranium goes off the chart? So let's zoom out by a factor of 1,000. Hmm, it looks like it's still off the chart. By a factor of 1,000 again? Crazy, right? Uranium's energy density is off the chart by multiple orders of magnitude. Sounds impressive, but what does that actually look like? Well, picture a bowl of jelly beans. The uranium fuel pellets that power the fission process in nuclear reactors are about the size of a jelly bean. So a jar of 100 jelly bean-sized fuel pellets can provide as much energy as a railroad car full with 100 tons of coal. Energy density is what makes it possible for nuclear to provide so much energy with so few land and material resources. While there's great concern about nuclear waste, I have learned there's not that much of it. If New England could get all of its electricity it would from nuclear, it would take 100 years to cover a football field 10 feet high with the spent fuel. Remember, energy density. Even my company's solar field, that was almost the size of a football field. But solar does have plenty going for it. The sun will shine for billions of years. What about nuclear? Would we ever run out of uranium? If nothing about the industry changes, we may have 100 years. But if we consider demonstrated technologies that have yet to be commercialized, we're talking a billion years again. And to me, that's great news. But unfortunately, the US electric grid is just 20% nuclear. The majority of our electricity still comes from coal mining and natural gas fracking. If we look around the world, it's clear that those dirty energy sources, they could have been replaced by now. France and Ontario are proof that a nuclear buildout can replace fossil fuels and become the majority source of electricity. Their grids are among the cleanest in the world, and they stand in contrast to those of California and Germany where lots of solar and wind has lowered carbon emissions, but these sources are intermittent, requiring backup from fossil fuels and preventing full decarbonization. Well, we can also try and make changes on our own. Having a clean grid like France or Ontario, it matters a lot. And trust me, I eat tofu, I drive a Prius, I even take cold showers sometimes. But I know not everyone is interested in taking green to the extreme. Consider this. In the past 10 years, two nuclear power plants in New England were replaced with natural gas. It would con take convincing 2 million people to drive electric or 5 million people to go vegan to make up for that increase in carbon emissions. Our individual actions, they pale in comparison to large changes made to our energy system. By learning about nuclear, I bought the promise of bright green environmentalism. I believe we can solve energy poverty and climate change. While saving energy was my job, I accept the reality that we need a lot more of it. Because pushing energy savings on the developing world is unthinkable. 
I can't fathom telling anyone that they don't deserve our modern conveniences. A singular focus on energy savings is dark green. At its core, it means less people doing fewer things. The flip side is more positive. Nuclear energy that is clean, abundant, and dispatchable makes possible more opportunities for more people around the world. While the Malthusian famine never came and the population bomb never dropped, predicting calamity does not go out of style for the dark green side. Today's young generation is taught that climate change is going to wreck the world in their lifetime. But that message is depressing and unnecessary because there's a more hopeful story to share. And that's that if we look at the history of humanity, it's been one of innovation. While we are not perfect, we have overcome immense challenges, like famine, like disease. To solve climate change, we must continue embracing this innovation with our most powerful, or rather, our most energy-dense technologies. Caring about the poor and caring about the planet These are both causes that speak for themselves. If you care about both, the story I learned about nuclear, well, it is a must read. Thank you.